think we're rolling. So, uh, Enrique obtained his master's degree at the University of Copenhagen under the supervision of Laura Mancheska in 2021 and is now a PhD candidate in mathematics at the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore, supervised by Marco Tomamichel. His research interests lie in the areas of quantum information, cryptography, machine learning, and algorithms. Let us all welcome our speaker. Um, great, awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, as discussed, I'm going to be presenting a work that I did with Laura some years ago as part of my master's thesis on weak sure sampling algorithms. Um, so as for a little overview of the talk, um, first, I'm just going to get everybody up to speed with all the necessary background. So this requires a little bit of uh, results from group theory and representation theory, uh, which will allow us to introduce uh, the Schur transform, how it's usually constructed in the literature, um, and then in particular focus on our problem of weak Schur sampling and the algorithm that we came up with uh, weak Schur sampling. We'll give a quick proof sketch of the proof of the correctness of our algorithm. Um, and then I will kind of uh, give some conclusions on its runtime and its space complexities. Awesome. Um, so this talk is a little bit um, by necessity of notation. Sure, well, duality can be a little bit complex. Um, so if at any point any of the matrices or labels that I'm introducing is confusing, please feel free to interrupt and stop to ask questions at any point throughout the talk. Cool. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, so as promised, some preliminaries on group theory and representation theory. So we call um, a representation of a group um, a, a, a group homomorphism between the group and the general linear group on a vector space, namely a math between some group elements and a corresponding matrix on acting on some vector space. Uh, this representation row is unitary if it satisfies the usual unitary identity relations. Uh, so as a quick example, that so we'll be focusing on through this talk is the representation of a unitary group on um, elements of uh, on, on qubits, basically, which takes in a matrix U of dimension D and applies it to each of the uh, tensors in the n-fold tensor product. Likewise, for the symmetric group on a permutation of n elements, a uh, representation that we'll be looking at is that, that which permutes the elements of the n-fold tensor product, right? Um, so just uh, again, uh, the unitary representation takes u and applies it to each element on the tensor product and the uh, representation p for the symmetric group permutes the n elements of the tensor product. Um, so for, the, for example, for the symmetric group, you have on two elements, on two qubits, you have two permutations, the identity and the transposition. The identity is just the identity map. And for the transposition, you just um, 0, 0 stays the same, 1, 1 stays the same, 0, 1 goes to 1, 0, and 1, 0 goes to 0, 1. Pretty simple stuff. So an important factor of representation theory is that of irreducible representations. We call a representation irreducible if, uh, if there is some subspace that is left invariant under an action from that representation. And moreover, uh, the subspace cannot be um, made smaller such that the representation is still invariant on that subspace. An important fact from representation theory is that uh, every unitary representation admits a decomposition into a direct sum of irreducible representations. So basically, uh, there exists some basis that uh, spans all the different irreducible subspaces, U, such that under this basis, the, the matrix of the representation rho G um, can be written as a direct product of the so-called irreducible representations acting on each of the different subspaces. Uh, you index these uh, irreducible representations with some index lambda, dependent on the group and the matrix that you're dealing with. Um, but the ones acting on each irreducible subspace will be given by these row lambdas, and each of them happens with some multiplicity than by n lambda. Right? So this is going to be a block diagonal matrix under this basis, essentially. At the same basis, therefore, also induces some um, so-called isotypic decomposition, isotypic being the same type uh, of the minimal invariant subspaces, V lambdas, uh, each of which happens with some multiplicity given by M lambda. As another quick example uh, for the symmetric group, uh, for the, we ignore the trivial um, identity transposition for now, the permutation, sorry. Um, for the transposition, for two qubits, we notice that the 
three one-dimensional spaces given by the 0, 0, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, and 1, 1 are left invariant under this transposition. And indeed, these are three copies of a one-dimensional so-called trivial irreducible representation. Uh, likewise, the last uh, vector in uh, two, uh, spanning the space of two qubits is that of 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Uh, this one is also left invariant under the transposition, except it picks up a negative sign. Okay? This is the, the so-called one-dimensional um, sign irreducible representation. In this basis, then you can check that the uh, matrix corresponding to the representation of the transposition gets divided into a block diagonal sum of three identities, three copies of a one-dimensional trivial irrep, one, two, three, and a minus one for the last basis element, okay, the, for the sign of reducible representation. Uh, likewise, you can check that for the unitary group, uh, the three-dimensional space spanned by zero, 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 one, plus one, zero, and one, one, sorry, uh, is left invariant. And likewise, that the uh, the last vector, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, uh, is also left invariant under the unitary group representation. In fact, it, you can check that if you multiply this by u tensor u, it just picks up a determinant of u constant in the front. Under this basis, then one can check that um, the unitary representation breaks up into a block diagonal decomposition of a 3 by 3 matrix and a constant of a uh, determinant of u. Okay, which because it's unitary, it's a unimodular determinant. So the main result that we'll be looking at this um, talk is that of Schubert duality, very powerful results in representation theory. Um, essentially, because both the symmetric group representation and the unitary group representation are unitary representations, they admit this so-called isotopic decomposition that we just saw, right? Uh, in particular, both of them break up the space of n qubits into a sum of the reducible representations indexed by their particular multiplicity, so indexed by lambda and um, with some particular multiplicity, and same for the unitary group. So, well, duality in particular states that um, under the combined action of the group, the tensor space of n qubits um, breaks up into a direct sum of um, products of the unitary group representations and the symmetric group representations. Intuitively, sure world duality, what it's telling you is that the multiplicity spaces of the symmetric group, given by the C and lambda, are isomorphic to the reducible representations of the unitary group, Q lambda, and likewise, that the multiplicity spaces of the unitary group, the C and lambdas, are isomorphic to the irreps of the symmetric group, P lambda and such that you get this isotopic decomposition as products of symmetric irreps times unitary irreps. Uh, so for example, we just saw that the subspace 0, 0, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, and 1, 1 is three copies of one dimension irreducible representation for the symmetric group, and likewise one copy of a three-dimensional representation. Three copies, three-dimensional, one-dimensional, one copy. Uh, likewise, so a little bit more trivially, the subspace 0, 1, minus 1, 0 is a one copy of a one dimensional, one copy, one dimensional, and then one copy, one dimensional. Um, as such, over this basis, you can rewrite the tensor space of uh, two qubits into this sum. Um, I should say as well that uh, for the symmetric group and for the unitary group, the way you index the uh, irreducible representations is via partitions of n, n being the number. Maybe I should go back one slide. Um, this lambda here, indexing this isotopic decomposition, is over partitions of n that have at most d elements. Partitions being uh, a tuple of non-decreasing, sorry, of non-increasing numbers that add up to n. So, for example, in this case, uh, we're trying to partition two with at most two elements, and the only possible partitions are therefore zero and one one. Okay. Everything clear with this? Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, right. So now onto the Schur transform. Um, so the Schur transform is precisely um, the matrix, the unitary transformation that performs the switch from the isotopic decomposition given by products of irreps of the symmetric and the unitary group onto the Schur basis, which is the the basis that respects this isotopic decomposition. Okay. So transform is precisely the map performing this basis change. Okay. Um, here, the Schur basis is just a, we, we index it by the lambdas, which are the partition that index the isotopic space. Okay. 
P lambda would be your index within the dimension of P lambda, uh, of big P lambda, and this little Q lambda would be the index or would be the label that indexes the dimension of this Q lambda D, right? So this will go, say, from zero to the dimension of P lambda, and this little Q lambda will go from zero to the dimension of big Q lambda. Okay. So for example, for two qubits, uh, we have already seen that the, the Schur transform is going to be given by the basis 1, 0, 0. So this is ket 0, 0. This is ket 0, 1 plus ket 1, 0. This would be ket 1, 1, and this ket 1, 0 minus ket 0, 1. Okay, And that's just the Schur basis for uh, two qubits. I should say there exists more than uh, one Schur basis, right? So, um, but maybe I'll discuss a little bit more on this later. Um, so, Part of the focus on this talk is how do you build the Schur transforms, right? So the Schur transform was originally introduced by Bacon, Chang, and Harrow in 2005. And the way they construct the Schur transform is via products of these Klebsch-Gordon transforms, okay? So the Klebsch-Gordon transform is precisely this unitary matrix, okay, that uh, takes in a particular irrep of the unitary group, Q lambda. And when you add a different Q dit, uh, spanned by space CD, then the Klebsch gordon transform maps this Q lambda into a direct sum of unitary group representations indexed by some partition lambda to which you've added uh, an element on the jth element of that tuple, right? So basically, if, you're, if lambda is originally, uh, say, um, two for partitioning two, then when you add an extra Q dit, this sum is going to go over partitions three, zero, and to one, or possibly. Oh, those are the only two, sorry. <laughs> um, so basically that's just what this notation means. So you interpret lambda as a vector of D elements and you add uh, a one to the jth entry and then you directly sum all the uh, different outputs. Um, for a little bit of intuition on the Klebsch gordon transform, if you're a physicist, the Klebsch gordon transforms tell you precisely how you add um, particles of different spin together, right? So uh, there's a direct correspondence for qubits between the partition lambda and the spin number j. And this Klebsch gordon transform basically tells you how to add um, different spin particles together, right? So for example, if you have a spin particle two and you add a spin particle a half, then the resultant outcome would be uh, sum of spin two half plus spin one and a half, okay? For mathematicians, this Klebsch gordon transforms basically give you the, the rules on how you build Young diagrams. Okay, so this lambda partition is going to correspond to some diagram of boxes called a young diagram, which has a number of boxes equal to the to the tuple. So, like for instance, tuple four three two will have four boxes, three boxes, two boxes, and then when you add an extra box given by some CD, it tells you how you construct the new young diagrams. Uh, for computer scientists, I don't really know what the intuitive way of explaining let's go and transform are. So you're on your own there. Sorry. Now. So basically what this Klebsch gordon transform do is tell you the update rules, update rules for a single unitary group representation, okay? Um, and this is say from n qubits to n plus one qubits. So basically it raises the Schur basis from n to n plus one qubits for a particular unitary group of reducible representations. So therefore to build the entire Schur basis, to raise the entire Schur basis from n to n plus one qubits, what you need to do is apply a Klebsch gordon transform to each copy of each irreducible representation given by lambda. And how do you do this? With a so-called super Klebsch gordon transform, okay? Basically, the super Klebsch gordon transform maps the sure basis on n qubits given by this um, direct sum here, and then you add an extra qubit, and it maps it to the sure basis of n plus one qubits. The corresponding super Klebsch gordon transform is gonna precisely take a Klebsch gordon transform and apply it to each copy of, um, of partition lambda. And again, remember that by sure world duality, there are exactly dimension, uh, uh, there are as many copies as the dimension of the particular symmetric group error. And then you're going to do the same for all um, the different partitions that index a particular irreducible representation. Okay. So basically, the super Klebsch Gordon transform applies a Klebsch Gordon to each copy of each irrep. And as such, it raises the basis from n to n plus one units. Okay. Um, therefore, to build a short transform on n qubits, what we need to do is apply a total of n minus one superclebsch gordon transforms. 
This will this one will bring the bases from one to two qubits, blah blah blah, and minus two to n minus one qubits, and minus one to n qubits. Is that more or less clear for everybody? Cool. Um, so the short transform in general is very useful in any quantum computation protocol that requires you to exploit the symmetries of um, the underlying system. Uh, for example, some might be familiar with the Finetti theorems. These are proven using, uh, or some of them are proven via the short transform. But in particular, one application that we're interested in is that of weak short sampling. Okay. So weak short sampling is the process of measuring a particular um, label, so-called young label lambda, which uh, again is the one that indexes the, the, the esotypic space that you're in. Okay. Um, which is something is usually performed by the uh, co-isometry here on the screen, right? That takes the entire space onto the particular copy, sorry, onto the particular uh, space that you're interested in. And intuitively, this co-isometry, this matrix um, U lambda, is given by um, an application of the of the entire Schur transform on n qubits, and then a suitable projection in the Schur basis to the space that you're interested in, right? So. Intuitively, this is just um, this this matrix U lambda is going to be the entire Schur transform, but only the rows of vectors of the Schur of the Schur uh, transform that correspond to or, or that uh, map this particular isotopic subspace. Okay, um, basically, this uh, this projection is just going to be uh, an identity matrix with the ones only in the rows that correspond to this space. Okay. As given by this equation here. Um, so which or something is therefore achieved via the, the CPTP map that takes a matrix row and uh, pre-multiplies pre -multiplies it and multiplies it by this co-isometry, u lambda weak sure. Okay. Uh, which or something is a very useful subroutine. It's used in a lot of uh, processes, including you know, state, state tomography, spectrum estimation, uh, data compression and decompression. Um, cannot think of anything else. Yeah, but uh, it, it's very useful and it's um, it's usually uh, performed as a black box operation, uh, but in truth what's happening is this, right? Like you perform the short transform and then you project onto the basis that you're interested in. Um, it's a little bit of a costly operation as a result, right? Because you're trying to weak through something. You're trying to when you weak through something, you're uh, projecting onto a specific subset of uh, the state space of n qubits. Um, so it's very costly that you have to first switch the basis and then perform the suitable projection, right? Um, there are more efficient algorithms. For example, the uh, uh, the generalized phase estimation algorithm, also by R. M. Hiro which performs this projection directly, but still requires a memory of n qubits, sorry, n qubits and a gate count of polynomial in n, okay? Um, from the work by Kirby and Strack, we know that uh, an application of the short transform is this expensive and requires this many uh, memories, memory qubits, okay? Um, but as a quick recap of this, uh, introductory sections, the Schur transform is precisely the uh, matrix that maps the computational basis of n qubits to the Schur basis, which respects the isotopic decomposition of irreps of the symmetric and unitary groups. You construct it through a sequence of applications of uh, sequential application of these super collapsed Gordon transforms, which raise the basis from n to n plus one qubits. And then which is something, which is the task that we're interested in, you're projecting uh, or you're interested in measuring a particular young label lambda, which collapses your state space into one of these isotopic subspaces. Okay, so we're trying to come up with an algorithm that performs this weak sampling in a much more efficient manner without having to first transform the entire basis and then projecting onto the isotopic space that we're interested in. So the algorithm that Laura and I introduced uh, is as follows. Right, so um, it's a it's a streaming algorithm as well. Uh, you don't need to have information about the entire state space. You can just receive uh, key dits as they come. Okay. Uh, the way it works is that you begin with uh, I should say q dit. I'm sorry. Um, you start with some q dits in in uh, corresponding to a partition one. Okay. 
And then what you do is a sequential application of uh, such that at the beginning of the kth iteration, um, you are in some irrep of the unitary group Q lambda. You apply the Clef Gordon transform corresponding to that lambda. Okay, when you add the next qdit given by um, cd, which is the same as qd1, this Clef Gordon transform maps you into this direct sum of the q lambda plus ej, as we saw before. And then what you do is you apply a measurement onto this lambda plus ej's, right? So basically, you begin at some q lambda, you apply the Clef Gordon transform. You're, you arrive uh, at a direct sum of this Q lambda plus Ej's, then you project onto one particular uh, irrep lambda plus Ej, and this is the lambda that you feed to the next iteration, right? And then at the end of the n minus one rounds, you return the, the final uh, irrep lambda that you're in. Okay, so it's a couple of a priori advantages that you see. So firstly, the algorithm is a lot more efficient uh, because in each iteration, instead of having to apply a super clef Gordon transform, which recall is a clef Gordon transform for each copy of each irrep lambda, here we apply a single clef Gordon transform, only one for one lambda, okay? And as such, it has to perform, it's much less operationally intensive. Uh, secondly, because in each iteration, you don't need to store the basis of n or, or sorry, on, on k qubits or q dits, sorry. You only need to store a particular irrep q lambda. Uh, and as such, you only need to you only really need to store a logarithmically many amount of q dits, right? Because the, the dimension of this q lambda d is logarithmic in d. Okay. Of course, the big elephant in the room is that we don't know if this algorithm is so-called correct, right? Uh, we don't know if the lambda that gets output um, at the end of this algorithm by performing the sequence of clef current transform and then projections onto a particular irrep, we don't know if it's going to arrive at this lambda with the same probability as it would have if you were to first apply the short transform and then measure a particular lambda space. Okay. Uh, so in fact, the main crux of this work was proving that this is indeed the case, right? So that if you start with a particular state row, um, the output lambda of this algorithm is the same as if you were to first measure, sorry, as if you were to first transform the, the, the state row into the sure basis via the sure transform and then perform the suitable projection onto space lambda. Okay, so recall that this is what this CBDD map, um, math call u does. Okay. And this little co-isometry, u lambda, is this transform followed by the projection on the isotopic subspace that we're interested in. So in what follows, I'm going to give a quick sketch of the proof of this. Um, for a little bit of intuition, before we go into the proof, um, essentially what we're wanting to show is that the matrix that corresponds, uh, the, the matrix of this map, the u lambda, which I can recall is the short transform but only the rows that correspond to the particular isotopic decomposition lambda. We're trying to show that this matrix is the same as the matrix that corresponds to one application of our algorithm, okay, which again requires a clip gordon transform followed by a projection on each round, okay. There's a little bit notationally involved, so please stop me at any point to clarify any notation. So for starters, um, we're going to call uh, an n tuple of partitions uh, a path. Okay. Uh, this path pi for some partition of n given by lambda is going to be a tuple of partitions lambda 1 through to lambda n, where lambda k, the kth element of this tuple, is a partition of k. The k plus 1th element of this tuple is obtained by, um, is obtained from lambda k by adding uh, a 1 suitably, right? So basically that you can get from partition k to partition k plus one. And lastly, that the last partition is a path corresponding to a partition lambda, okay? From true world duality, we know that are exactly, um, the, the, there are exactly as many paths as the dimension of the symmetric group irreducible representation, okay? So we can index these paths with the little p lambda label of the sure basis, okay? So an instance of our algorithm, which again 
is a sequential application of collapsed Gordon transforms and then a projection such that uh, in each round, in each, uh, in each round of this for loop, you add a one on the particular irreducible representation that you began that uh, iteration with. Okay. So this uh, any sort of algorithm is going to correspond to this map, right? Which starts from the n state, from the state space of n units onto a particular copy q lambda indexed by this little p lambda label. Um, and it's going to correspond to a product of this class Gordon transforms on the kth element of the path to the final partition lambda, okay, times the suitable projection that ended up on that path. Okay, so that's the measurement that you perform. And um, again, what we're trying to show is uh, what we're trying to look at how this matrix looks like, essentially. Um, if you take all paths that might end you up at partition lambda, um, one application of our algorithm corresponds to uh, the addition over all paths of this matrix u tilde lambda p lambda that we saw just here. Okay. Um, so then to show correctness, what we need to show is that the sum over all the paths of this matrix is equal to oops, the matrix, um, or rather the CPTP map corresponding to an application of the Schurz transform and then a suitable projection, right? So basically showing that the sum of co-isometries given by this, again, one of these things is uh, a product of class current transforms followed by projection following a particular path index by P lambda. And we're trying to show that that co-isometry is the same as the co-isometry corresponding to an application of the Schurz transform and then a suitable projection, okay? Uh, intuitively, the way this works is that uh, you, you, well, this proof is really intuitive once you look at how this uh, Schur transforms work, right? So when you build the Schur transform set for three qubits, what you're doing is, well, first you start in um, with just a single qubit, or a qubit, sorry, that's just going to be in space uh, CD. You add an extra qubit and you apply the super collapse Gordon transform. That's going to arrive you at a direct sum of partitions Q2 and Q11. Then you apply another Klebsch-Gordon transform, super Klebsch-Gordon transform, which applies a Klebsch-Gordon transform here and a Klebsch-Gordon transform here. From here, you split two into three and into two one. And then from here, you split one one into just two one. And the true transform is gonna be precisely this um, eight by eight matrix. Say that you're interested in measuring partition two one. So you ignore this partition three. The matrix correspond the co-isometry corresponding to this uh, short transform and then projection onto the two one space is going to just be the last four rows. Okay, these two rows here correspond to the basis of this first copy, and these two last rows correspond to the basis of that last copy. And the co-isometry will just be these first four rows being zero. Okay. Likewise, um, so yeah, the co-isometry mapping um, to partition two one is just given by this matrix. Okay. Um, and yeah, it corresponds to the search transform spanning the copies of only that partition, right? The first two the first two rows to the first copy and the last two rows to the second copy. Um, for our algorithm, what it does is that it only traverses one of these red paths, okay? So again, the first iteration, we receive the first qubit, we apply a Klebsch Gordon transform, which reaches us to a direct sum of two and one, one, but then we perform a projective measurement, which uh, arrives us at either two or one one. If we had measured two, then a Klebsch Gordon transform puts us in three or two one, and then to end up at two one, we just need to perform this projection corresponding to this red path. Likewise, if we had originally measured partition one one after the first uh, round of measurements, then we apply a Klebsch Gordon transform and we just deterministically arrive at this two one. Okay, so our algorithm basically has to traverse one of these paths. You can work out that the matrix corresponding to the first path is just a short transform, uh, but with zeros in all the rows that do not correspond to the basis of that copy that we arrived at. And likewise, if we had traversed the other path, the corresponding matrix matrix is just um, the short transform, but only with the basis that span that copy. Um, you can easily tell that if you were to add these two matrices together, corresponding to a probabilistic sum of the paths that you could have traversed, you end up with the same matrix as though you were as if you had performed this transform originally, and then the isotopic projection at the end. Okay, 
And in general, this holds for n d dimensional uh, uh, systems, so for n qubits. Uh, so this is basically the cracks of the proof showing that the two matrices therefore equal. Okay. Um, but yeah, using in, in this way, you can just prove that the, our algorithm is indeed correct and it will always arrive at the same um, irreducible representation with the same probability as if you had first transformed the sure basis to the sure basis and then performed the projection. And in conclusion, this algorithm is a little bit more efficient, right? So the rest of the, of, of the paper just deals uh, with uh, counting the number of uh, an upper bound and the number of gates required uh, to perform this picture transform and then the memory requirements. But again, by virtue of having only to store um, a single irreducible representation of the unitary group, you don't have to store the entire basis and then you save a lot of um, qubits, sorry, a lot of memory qubits as a result going from order n to order log n. Uh, so yeah, much more efficient than previous efficient algorithms than like the GP, for example, like the GP or the the usual short transform followed by a projection. Um, yeah, that's basically all the talk. A little bit short and sweet to not keep you from your Friday plans. Uh, please let me know if there are any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice and very didactic. Uh, as our speaker said, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, uh, hi, Enric. Um, do you know that yeah, you uh, your algorithm is optimal, or like how how could you judge uh, how far is it away from the optimal algorithm? Do we know it? What kind? Uh, what is optimal given like a, a n copy in d-dimensional uh, systems? Um. Optimal in terms of um, number of operations. In terms of yeah, in terms of gate counts or the memory space, so is there a is there a yeah, um, so, lower bound? So no, I do not have a lower bounds. Um, but maybe if I can go back to the um, to the talk here, which I don't know where it has gone on my computer. Um, yeah. So the way that this um, n to the power sorry this one n to the power of three is computed. So these are basically the uh, similar to the to the um, to the method outlined in the paper that mm -hmm. comes up with this n to the power of four by Kirby and Strauch a few years ago. Mm -hmm. The way it's done is by um, breaking down the number of uh, so-called given rotation, this uh, two-level um, unitaries that you apply mm -hmm. to uh, that eventually end up multiplying to the short transform. The way that these are counted is by counting the the number of non-zero elements below mm -hmm. the main diagonal of mm -hmm. the matrix that you're trying to mm -hmm. uh, to do. In our case, we're trying to count the number of non-zero entries of the Klebsch-Gordon transforms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as a level of intuition for qubits, this Klebsch-Gordon transforms will have only two, or at most two, non-zero elements per row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the way you arrive at this n cubed is just by assuming that those two non-zero elements are below the main diagonal as your worst case, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think you can do better than this n cubed by taking into account that you might actually only do one or versus two elements below the main diagonal. I don't know if you can mm -hmm. do any better, mm -hmm. but no, I okay. don't have an explicit lower bound. Okay. I see. Um, with regards to the space requirements, if I remember correctly, it might actually be two log n, but overall this is just log n. And okay. this counts on say like qubits as well. Okay. Uh, uh, because one of I was talking to one of the crew members who seems to be interested in this domain. So yeah, so uh, Ming Jian, uh, maybe you can think about proving whether this this algorithm is optimal or not, right? So this might be a a direction to to proceed. Yeah, I understand. If you if you if you like this type of uh, research directions, yeah. okay. Uh, Eric, are you in Singapore now? No, I am in Norway. I'm in Europe for the December month. Okay. Uh, I saw the introduction that you would join Marco Tomamichel's group, right? Uh, yes. Um, I've been in Marco's group for uh, about a year and a half now. I think oh, we really? met when you visited in Marco. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You were telling because me you... where to visit in Taipei. Yes, yes, yes. Are you coming for QIP? 
Yes, I'm very excited oh. to return to Taipei for QAP. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so maybe um, Ming Jian on the screen is the one who find the topic very interesting. So uh, just when you when you come, we could uh, maybe talk a little bit more and and uh, see course, whether yeah, there's that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, um, I actually was sure, in maybe. Singapore a couple a couple of days ago, so I, but I did not see you. <laughs> you are yes, in I, left, Europe uh, right now. I left a week before. I heard okay. you went to the Sakaya with uh, with Erica and Marco. I hope that was fun. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I don't know if maybe Laura will be in QAP as well. Um, mm, okay. Maybe this would be possible also to discuss with her also. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I actually uh, met Laura this September in Denmark. I visited, oh, nice. uh, yeah, I visited your group, but they was very quiet. That's just she preparing lecture notes and everybody else going to this um, holiday event. So it's like a, an excursion of the group to oh. some, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's fine. I mean, I believe that uh, most of people will come to QIP and I we can get our chat again. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I don't have any further questions. So maybe uh, if if anyone has questions, just speak speak up. Uh, actually, uh, I I do have uh, one question, perhaps kind of for you, uh, Enrique, yeah. and kind of from from Michio as well, because today you mentioned a work that you didn't show, which used a port based teleportation as well, right? Uh, and me? I think it's uh, connected with this work and somehow. I I'm not sure if, if you know the connection, uh, Enrique. With port-based teleportation? No, I'm not too familiar with this topic, unfortunately. Mm. Okay, okay, um, no problem. You mean I'll try to, uh, I'll try to. Oh. Yes, yes, uh, I mean, I I'm not sure uh, how exactly they connect. But I, I remember the paper mentioned something about it. And I kind of um, got curious if, if there is anything from, from your work that would be applied there or not. But I would need to, to, to learn more, of, of course. So I guess the, the, the intention of, this, uh, the, of the applications for this work is, well, there's a lot of papers, for example, about like Masahito, for example, on like this uh, spectrum estimation, uh, data compression, et cetera, that just kind of use picture sampling as a black box. Uh, the intention of this was just to provide a, a more efficient black box, I guess. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, but, um, maybe it answers your question. So at least I know that for spectrum estimation, the, um, this lambda partitions that I kept on talking about in the talk give you um, a pretty good estimation of the uh, of the spectrum of a particular system of d qubits. So maybe that's a that means something. Okay. okay, no problem. Uh, do we have more questions for you from the audience? Uh, sorry. Uh, so maybe I I want to ask some question to clarify. So in each iteration of your step, you require the CG coefficient, right? So this CG coefficient must be calculated beforehand. So is it complicated? To do the uh, this lambda, CG. you mean at each iteration? No, no, the CG. Do you need the CG coefficient? Oh, um, well, I mean, I guess implicitly our algorithm assumes that you already have access to this CG coefficients. Um, but in general, they're known. No, what these coefficients look like in the standard basis. So you mean don't don't need to ex have this or you need this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Implicitly you do need them. Yeah, yeah. Like we assume that we're able to apply this clash cord and transforms. Yeah. So we assume that we already have the coefficients. Okay. So uh so in each step it is exact, right? So why there is a error at, at your complexity requirement? I mean, uh how how does the error come from? The error in the complexity for the for the in, in your conclusion your in your conclusion your complexity depend on the epsilon right? 
the gate count. Uh, uh, yeah, so the the error is just uh, the error in approximating uh, unitary via this uh, two level gates, right? Uh, I think it's just some result from the similar to like the solo like time theorem. It's just an error you pick up. Mm -hmm. If you okay. want to approximate a particular unitary with this so called givens rotations. I see, I see. I think it's just okay. the accuracy of the approximation in like diamond norm. So in each step, do you need to control the the arrow? So there's this result. I think you can find in the um, uh, the Michael and Chuan book that says that this error scales on, only linearly. If you uh, with um, so say you try to approximate with m number of gates, this uh, this error only uh, scales linearly. So it's not too bad. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you for a nice talk. Oh, we don't hear you. I think you're yeah. muted, Leandro. Yeah.